What is up guys? This is the second part in our monocular visual odometry series. In the first part, we understood what visual odometry is for monocular case and also understood the math behind it. In this part, we will build a monocular visual odometry example from scratch. So we will code everything ourselves in C++. Of course, we will use some helper methods from OpenCV. But apart from that, we will build everything from scratch and run it on a Kitty monocular data set. Now, if you don't have a mathematical understanding of visual odometry, please check out my previous video. This was the one I was talking about. But this was basically the mathematical gist of visual odometry and we will implement all these steps in C++ and see our visual odometry feature in action on the Kitty dataset. Remember that this is the camera coordinate system and this is also used in our Kitty dataset. So we will use Z and X. Y is actually pointing to the ground. Now, before you start, I have a link of my GitHub repo, which hosts all the code here. So you can check it out and use that along with you following this video as well. Before you start coding, you have to first download the Kitty dataset for the monocular case. And this is where you go. I have the link in the description as well and on my GitHub repo. Download this and this. The first one is to get your images. And the second one is to get the ground truth poses that we will use in our code. And you will understand what I'm talking about when we actually code all of that. I have already downloaded this kitty dataset and this is what it looks like for me. I am in the kitty dataset directory inside this repo and I have data odometry gray and data odometry poses that we got from both the downloads. We will use one of the set of images. So this is what we will use. We also have the calibration data for the cameras. We will use this calib.txt file to get the calibration data from the camera. And if you go back, You also have your ground root poses. So we will use 00.txt because that is the set of images we are going to use for our example. So I hope you have the data set ready. This is what it should look like and you can delete the zip files if you want. Now let's start actually coding our visual odometry example in C++. This is my project. Again, you can look at GitHub to get all the code here. But let's start with your header files. This is my visual odometry class that runs my visual odometry feature. Here you have your includes. You have your namespaces as usual. This is the class. You have a default constructor because you don't want to initialize anything in the constructor. This is a very simple example, of course. And then you have your run method that runs visual odometry on your dataset path. So we will give the right dataset path according to where we stored our downloaded images. And then we will run visual odometry on that. Now let's look at main.cpp before we go to the actual core methods here. In main.cpp, you have your imports. And inside the function, you initialize your visual odometry class. You prepare the path. The path is exactly this one. So you have this path in your data set. We will use image underscore zero. This is a monocular example. So we will only use images from one camera. Now you have your path ready on the application layer. You just have to do vo dot run and then give this path as a string. Now let's go to the core of this feature and understand how we set up the code inside visual odometry class. Inside SRC, you have your visual odometry.cpp file, which is the core of this video and this feature. You're obviously including your header file. Here you define the maximum number of frames you want to use, so how long you want to run this feature in general. And minimum number of feature is how many features you want to use in the image itself. I'm sure you understand what I mean by features because we've discussed this in the previous video. But this is where you actually get the features. So these are the minimum number of features you want in an image. We'll come back to this function called get absolute scale. But in essence, you want to get the absolute scale of your movement. As we discussed in the first video, in monocular case, you cannot get the absolute scale. That's why in this example, we are looking at ground truth poses to get the absolute scale so that we know how far the car has moved. Now looking at the class visual odometry, our constructor was default, so we don't need to write anything there. This was the method we wrote. Let's look at this method. And this method is the crux of this video. Please remember that this is what we want to implement step by step now. This is where you have your matrices, image one and image two to get your image in a matrix. And then RF and TF are the final rotation and translation vectors that contain the camera pose. We will get the scale from the function we defined above. But here, let's start with the scale of one. This is just you initializing a value for the scale. These variables are just to get your file names. 
Now, this is where you get the first two files in this directory. In the dataset directory, you have consecutive ego motion images for the vehicle moving forward. This is simplest stuff we use to display images later using OpenCV. Now here you read the files to get your images. You will get them in color, not black and white by default. This is just you saying there's an error if the path was incorrect. Now for monocular case, we will use grayscale images. So we convert colored images to grayscale images. You are getting the first two images. Now. We will, of course, do everything iteratively, but we need to first process the first two images before we can establish a loop and keep using the loop using only the current image and the features from the previous image. In the math you see here, you need the features from the previous frame to actually compute whatever features you want to track them and to compute the matrices for the current image. But you first need to use the first two images to compute some things, which includes your previous features, but you also need to compute CK minus one. So that's why we want to first use the first two images and then we start our loop. Now we use image one to get the feature. We have something called feature detection as a function and feature tracking as a function that are a part of our utilities. We'll talk about three utility methods we've created, feature detection, feature tracking, and get calibration data in a bit. But right now, let's assume that you have something called feature detection as a function that gives you all the features in the variable points one. The next thing you do is, since you have two images, you want to track the features you got from feature detection in the second image. Now, in this example, we are using feature tracking not feature matching. So that is an important point to remember. The next bit is to get your calibration data. So this is camera specific. We have a file called calib.txt given in the data set. That is what we use. So this function get calibration data will read that file and get the camera parameters. Now we've talked about three different utility functions, feature detection, feature tracking, and get calibration data. So before we move on to computing the essential matrix and using it to get the rotation matrix, let's actually go back and look at these three utility functions. They are a part of view underscore utils dot h. The first one is calibration data that takes the data set path. It reads calib.txt and in that file, you have calibration values. So you have these three values, it reads them and these are put in your variables. These are the two variables you passed as reference and these are put here after you read from the file. Next method is feature tracking. Now, once you detect your features, you have to track them. You have image one and image two as inputs. And then you also have points one that is populated because you've already uh, detected features. Points two will be either empty or will be stale. And status is a variable that is used to check if uh, your optical flow uh, Lucas Canade method worked properly. Here you set some parameters for uh, optical flow. This is the method used in OpenCV to do it. And you also import all of this. These are all the imports here. These are your namespaces here. Now using this feature in OpenCV, you will get points two, which are actually tracked features based on your image one, image two, and points one. You will also get your status. But the thing is, there's always a chance that a feature is not tracked in the next image, namely image underscore two. Either the KLT tracking failed or the image does not have that feature anymore. In that case, this part removes everything in points two that was not actually tracked. So this loop actually removes everything from points one and points two that is not relevant anymore. So if in points two, you don't have a feature at all that was in points one, we remove all of that. And that's how you get points two, which will be populated properly. And even points one will change because all the irrelevant points are removed here. Next one, feature detection. This is fast algorithm based feature detection, again from OpenCV. Here you want some key points based on some parameters. You then use your fast algorithm to compute these features and then you basically populate points one. So these were the three utility functions. Let's go back to our main code now. Now we were here, let's look at how we proceed now. What do we want to do? We have detected our features. We have matched or tracked our features. Now the third thing is computing your essential matrix for the image pair. You again use an OpenCV function to compute your essential matrix. What happens after that? You decompose your essential matrix into your rotation matrix and translation vector. This function from OpenCV does that. So you will get your R and T, namely your rotation matrix and your translation vector. The next step is normally to get your relative scale. But as I said, the first step was to establish your R and T so that we can start our loop. So after you've seen two images, you actually start this algorithm and run this iteratively. So for now, your final matrix for rotation is R and translation is T. 
So at this point, you actually have C, which is of course a combination of R, F and T, F. So that is your camera pose. This is where you start. And then we move on from here and run everything iteratively. This is just to show your images later. This is your trajectory matrix. And this is a 600 by 600 black image, which you will use and overlay your path on it to just visualize it. Now we finally start this iterative loop here. You already have the initial camera pose after two images. You work with that and as and when the vehicle moves, you will update it. This is where you get the next image, so the third image. As usual, you get the image and then change it to black and white. Now, as we know, the next step is to get the features and match them. Now, since we are using feature tracking and not feature matching, we can use the previous set of features and just track them in this image. After you have your tracked features, you compute your essential matrix. You then compute R and T. Now you will create two matrices, previous points and current points. Although you already have current features and previous features, they have a different data type. You want vectors and not points as your data structure because that will be used by OpenCV methods later. So this is what we do. We take our points, which are previous features and current features, and we use those values in a vector that we create. These vectors are previous points and current points. The next step is to compute the scale. So this is where we compute the scale and this is where the method get absolute scale comes in. While we are using this, let's look at get absolute scale function. This is the function we had created in this file. All it does is it looks at your ground truth data and gets the Euclidean distance between the current point and the previous point. So here you have your frame ID, which is the ID of the current frame. You read 00.txt in your poses directory. This loop gets your previous and your current position. If you read properly, you will see that this has indexing. So at I is equal to seven, you have your Y value at I is equal to three, you have your X value. And the last one, which is I is equal to 11, you have your Z value, which makes sense because this is what the matrix looks like. Once you have your X current values and X previous values, you find the Euclidean distance and you return so that you have the scale. We do not want to use the values from the ground root because then if we have the ground root, there's no point in doing all of this but we just want to use it for your scale. Now coming back here, this is how you get your scale. Once you have your scale, the next step is to get the new pose. The new camera pose uses this equation, C of K is equal to C of K minus one and T of K. You had C of K minus one before, they were RF and TF. And this is how you compute or how you move forward in time for the new camera pose. Look at this value, it's actually like multiplying these two matrices. And then you use the current values R of T in this case is R and T of T in this case is T. And the final one is again, T of F and R of F. So we are doing this iteratively. And this is how you get your final camera pose. At this point, you have your final camera pose for this time instant. Now, the interesting thing to note here is that as the vehicle moves forward, you cannot really expect the features you saw in your first image to be present all the time, right? You will lose features. And since you're using feature tracking, at some point you will lose features. That's why we had this constant, min underscore num underscore feet, so that you can maintain a minimum number of features. So what this part of code does is it looks at your number of features. If you do not have enough anymore because they were discarded, they were not seen anymore, you trigger feature detection again on previous underscore image, which was the image before the current one. And then you track them with the previous image and the current image. This is how you don't lose the number of features in time. You always want a certain number of features to be there. Now, this is just us preparing for the next cycle in this loop. And now we're just preparing for visualization. We are done with the core of this loop. This is for visualization. Now there's an offset on X for easier visualization. Otherwise your point when you're visualizing might start from let's say the very edge of one side. The same thing with Y, you also have offset, but you have an inversion because when you look at CV2, the direction of Y is the opposite to what we want. One other thing to note is that this is your camera coordinate system. So that's why for X you're using the index zero, but for Y you're using the index two because that's actually Z. And then, as I said, you need an inversion because in CV2, the direction of Y is the opposite. It actually goes down. And this is again, just preparation to show your final image for visualization. And this is where you visualize everything. This loop just continues until you have the minimum number of frames processed. So that's actually it. This is something we've set up. Now if you want to run this, you have CMake lists here that you can check. This is your CMake list. You can look at the GitHub repo to understand how that is set up, but this is quite simple. Now you have your main function. Let's actually run this and see what happens. To run this, make your build directory and go there. Run CMake. 
run make. Now you can run your executable. This is what it looks like. As the vehicle moves forward, we are calculating the trajectory and computing the actual camera pose based on all these images. And we visualize that in our trajectory window. This was monocular visual odometry for you. I hope this gave you an understanding of how to set up monocular visual odometry in C++. This was an example data set from Kitty, which is pretty good on its own, but you can also use this feature for your case. I'd love to know what you think about it. And thank you for watching this video. Again, look at my GitHub repo where all the code is hosted. You can play with that code, change parameters and see how it works out. Thanks for watching this video. I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.